Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our 7 Ways 10 Street will help make the clearinghouse regulations easier webinar. My name is Leah Kelly and I'm here with Shannon Wheeler, our General Counsel, and Elizabeth Sontag, Director of Product. We hosted a webinar back in August to help you make sense of the new clearinghouse requirements. And I'm going to include a link to that recording in the chat below in case you haven't had a chance to review it or want another chance to review it. But today we want to talk more about what 10 Street can do to remove the burden of those new requirements from you by adding more automation to your recruiting, onboarding, and safety processes, as well as bringing greater awareness about what these changes mean to your, to your drivers and to you while we do it. So, so you know, before we get started, this webinar will be recorded and sent to you within the next 24 hours. Also, feel free to submit your questions anytime throughout the webinar, and you can do so using the text box under the questions section in your GoToWebinar panel. We'll address those at the end. And then be sure, too, to check your handout section for a lot of information and clearinghouse fact sheets that we've kind of compiled into one document. We've included fact sheets on queries and consents and how to purchase a query plan, fact sheets for employers, for drivers, for CTPAs, and a federal register with, with final clearinghouse regulations. They're all in one file, like I said, and then we have a second file of 10th Street Sample Limited Query Consent Form, which we'll get to that, what that means in a minute. Uh, go ahead and download those handouts and make sure you see make sure you ask any questions that you may have. I'm going to go ahead and moving right along here to our agenda. Actually, if you go back one page, I just want to mention really quick what a great job Leah has done. <laughs> if you were on our previous webcast, it was a ball of yarn that was all jumbled and messy, just like this FMCSA clearinghouse is. It's messy, it's hard. We don't know uh, what is going to happen come January 6th because the FMCSA has been pretty, you know, limited on the details they will give available. But now, 10th Street, we're going to help you guys with this. The ball of yarn is nice and organized, and we're weaving it for we're you. Make it, something, make it into something meaningful, like a table runner, for example. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Shannon. <laughs> okay. So our agenda today, we're going to do a quick review of some of the things we hit on on our first presentation, like just some what the clearinghouse is and who, you know, what it means to you. We're going to talk next about the challenges that it's presenting to your processes and uh, what? and uh, the seven ways that we're going to help. And then we're going to get to your questions. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. And I'm going to let you go ahead and do your favorite part. Everybody's favorite part, the legal disclaimer. So um, the following information is educational only. It doesn't constitute legal advice. It's always we recommend that you consult with qualified legal counsel on all of the issues, laws, and regulations that we talk about. And of course, we just claim any warranties associated with this presentation. Um, it's, it's just educational information. Okay, so just real quick, I'm going to run through to recap, recap from the prior webinar. Um, what if you're just now joining us and you haven't seen our first webinar series, um, Leah is going to post a link in the comments section, and so she will give you a little, um, uh, uh, so you can sign up and go watch that. But what is the FMCSA Clearinghouse? If you're not quite sure yet, it's quickly it's an online database. It is under the FMCSA administration. It's acting as a central repository for drug and alcohol violations for CDL holders. Any violation information that occurs on or after January 6th of 2020 will be captured um, in the clearinghouse. And then um, there will be uh, mandatory reporting guidelines for um, uh, CDL holders. So mandatory reporting of um, uh, uh, violations and um, mandatory reporting of the return to duty process. So, um, and then of course there's the mandatory reporting of uh, or mandatory queries that you'll have to do annually for all your current drivers and any pre-hire uh, applicants you will have to run a full query on. Um, and so right now the FMCSA says that the security standards for the Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse are uh, meet all the federal security standards. Things like double authorization, things like that are what the drivers are going to have to um, uh, comply with. Also, um, your TPAs will have to comply with it and, and all the employers will have to comply with it. It's like double authorization, very stringent security requirements. 
Okay, so who will use the clearinghouse? We know that um, employers will have to uh, use the clearinghouse. There's going to be mandatory queries pre-hire, mandatory que queries annually um, on your current CDL holders, uh, currently employed ones, and mandatory reporting of drug and alcohol violations. Again, uh, the CDL holders and um, CLP holders will also um, use this clearinghouse. They can get in and see what information is reported on them. They will need to register. There are mandatory reporting obligations by MROs and um, and uh, substance abuse professionals. So um, all of those people will use the clearinghouse along with uh, consortiums and uh, third-party administrators. So. Um, Make sure that you designate 10th Street as your TPA. You, when you go in and register, it gives you the option. And um, we're going to talk about today some of the services we're going to offer. But 10th Street um, uh, will be offering TPA services. And when you go in and register, you can register as 10th Street as your as your TPA. And we'll talk a little bit more detail about this as well. Um, and then we know that state driver's license agencies um, will also be using the clearinghouse. Since our last update, um, state driver license agencies um, had a new um, rule from the FMCSA come out as a proposed rule back in September, which is actually going to delay their compliance until uh, January 6th of 2023. So we know that the states will have um, three years before they have mandatory compliance with that. But the proposed rule at least said that they can voluntarily query um, the clearinghouse up until then. So states might jump in and get involved before that three-year mark, um, but um, the, the regulatory um, environment around states and what they will have to do is a little bit uncertain still, given that there's a new proposed rule that is, um, is still out there. Um, so uh, we also know that state law enforcement agencies will be able to access the clearinghouse in real time. Say they pull a driver over and they want to see if they have any information in them in the clearinghouse, that's also going to be available to them. They estimate that somewhere between 4 and 6 million users will be using this clearinghouse. It's definitely very complicated, a lot of moving pieces, and the clearinghouse is being very limited in the information that they give out. Okay, so if you're wondering what information will be in the clearinghouse, um, it will be violations of only the DOT FMCSA testing violations. So I have a list there of um, what all those violations are. Of course, um, verified, positive, adulterated, or situated drug uh, test results, alcohol confirmation tests of 0.04 or higher, refusals, um, Verified and documented actual knowledge violations. That does include citations for DUI and DWI um, when driving a commercial motor vehicle. Um, alcohol use within four hours before going on duty. Alcohol use within eight hours after an accident or any um, other um, sort of testing, like random drug testing. Uh, prohibited drug use while on duty. But then also successful completion of the return to duty process and completion of follow-up testing will also be reported in the clearinghouse. But um, please note these are only for violations occurring on or after January 6th of 2020. Any violations that occur today or occurred yesterday uh, or even that occur on January 5th will not be reported to the clearinghouse. It is only violations on or after January 6th going forward that will be reported in the clearinghouse. So uh, what is the timeline? Right now, registration is open. You can follow um, that link, and it's just clearinghouse.fmcsa.dot.gov, and you can go register. Authorized um, users of um, your company can go register with the clearinghouse and create an account. You can also sign 10th Street up um, and other as, as third-party administrators within the system. Yep, this is Elizabeth. I just want to let everybody know that we are registered, so if you do choose to register us as your TPA, we should be available. And um, then January 6th, that's the go live date. Um, implementation of the clearinghouse will occur on that date. Um, hopefully, we'll have a lot more information before then. There'll be a lot more guidance put out about what the system is going to look like and how it's going to run before then, given that there's going to be four to six million users of the clearinghouse, hopefully. They're, the clearinghouse is continuing to put out information, um, so uh, we'll be ready by then. 
Um, but uh, mandatory reporting will start then, and mandatory queries will start on January 6th of 2020. And then um, January 6th of 2023, the regulations say that queries of the clearinghouse will satisfy the drug and alcohol portion of your employment verification. So you can still do the um, drug and alcohol portion of the employment verification at the, after that date if you have a release, but um, starting on January 6th of 2023, in three years, after three years of data is in the clearinghouse, you can just query the clearinghouse um, to satisfy your uh, drug and alcohol. But you will have to still do employment verifications for accidents and um, other safety performance history file. Everything else is required in 391.23. Okay, so what we know, we know that the clearinghouse has all of these new challenges, changes to your process, um, all of these things that are um, going to make it difficult. There's a, I've talked to a lot of people. I know um, Elizabeth has been talking to a lot of people. Our sales team and our account managers have been talking to a lot of people about the, the challenges that this clearinghouse is going to face. Um, and you're probably asking yourself, how will we help drivers register? How will we know if they have already registered? Um, do we want our drivers to register? How do we get a limited query consent? Um, how do we get this signed by drivers? either new hire drivers or all your current drivers? How will we meet the full query requirements? How will we get that information, you know, to us, to and from the clearinghouse? Does this affect our adverse action process? How will drivers be trained on these clearinghouse requirements? And, um, uh, of course, what are the record-keeping requirements and how will we manage all of this, the limited queries each year? And guess what? 10 Street's going to help with that. Okay, so I'm here today to help you guys through the different process of how 10th Street is going to be able to help you. We've kind of separated this out in four different areas around awareness, recruiting, onboarding, post-hire, and safety. So we're going to talk through each kind of one of each one of these scenarios and let you know how we're going to help make this easier and um, less painful for all of the users that use 10th Street. Um, so we're going to kind of walk in through, or we're going to walk through how to keep you informed. Um, registration Awareness and Transparency, 10th Street, Azure TPA, Limited and Full Consent Queries, Required Policy and Training Updates, as well as DQF, uh, Record Creeping Requirements, and Adverse Action. So a lot of that we're going to um, talk about uh, today, what, what the requirements are, and then what we're going to do to help. Yes. So Shannon and I are going to go through these together. <laughs> Okay, so carrier registration. Um, all carriers have to register with the clearinghouse. Um, it is absolutely mandatory and required that you register um, if you employ CDL holders that operate in the U.S. Even if it's a Canadian company or a Mer uh, Mexican company, you all must still register if a CDL holder will operate in the U.S. You will have to register um, your DOT by your DOT number if you have multiple. Um, authorities under multiple DOT numbers, you're going to have to register every single one of those DOT numbers. You will need to list your authorized user, um, and um, that list will be reauthorized annually. Um, that goes back to the security features that are required by the clearinghouse. Um, and then uh, you can go in and do that now. And then you can also um, designate assistant users. Um, so more than just one um, user from your company can go in and do that. You can also designate a third-party administrator. You can go in and if um, your uh, third party is already there and has already registered, you can go in and register. One key thing, you can have more than one third-party administrator. So if you uh, want to use one vendor for one thing and 10th Street for another, you can have more than one. And you have 10 days to update your third-party administrator if it changes. Um, you are one of the key things and big questions I get is, are we required to designate an MRO that will report info on our behalf? And no, you are not. The MROs are required to um, go in, register, and are required to report, regardless of whether that um, is tied to a carrier or not. And then we know that registration is valid for five years. Um, I, obviously, this will continue on for more than five years, but I think there is essentially re-registration um, re requirements um, in order to stay in the um, clearinghouse um, after five years. 
And then, um, okay, so I have gotten this question over and over again, a lot of confusion. Will your drivers have to register? And um, the answer is only if they are seeking new employment on or after January 6th uh, of 2020. And that is so that they can authorize a full query to, to occur within the clearinghouse. No registration will be necessary for drivers um, to run just the annual limited query um, that is going to be taking place. That's for you. If, they're currently working for you, um, or they're you know currently working for an employer. They will only need to go in and register if they are seeking new employment or if a full query is required. There is, we know, multi-factor authentication that they have to go through, um, and then they will set preferences on their communication. Unfortunately, the preferences right now, as they exist, are by email or U.S. mail. So um, if you're encouraging your drivers to go register. You're going to also encourage them to set their preference of communication on email. Make sure they do it on an email that um, they will use and that they will um, pay attention to because that will be their notification from the clearinghouse. And just as a side note, when they do register for the clearinghouse um, and they do select mail, it does say, are you sure that you want to select mail because it is snail mail. So it does double check with them. So encourage them to use email, but there is a little a little warning in there as well. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then um, their identification will be verified by their CDL number and, and their date of birth. It is not by social. Um, and then owner operators. Owner operators, the, the clearinghouse requirements on owner operators are really stringent. They essentially must comply with all of the employer, um, all the employer obligations and all of the driver obligations. So if they're a one-truck operation with an authority or if they're owner-operated with employees others, they will have to register and then they will have to designate a consortium or a TPA to complete the processes for them. Um, so the burden on owner-operators is going to be a lot greater. Um, however, um, if you are going to contract with owner-operators, it's going to be a best practice for you to uh, follow all of the requirements of, an, of the employer um, provisions as well with that owner operator um, like you would an employee driver. Okay, so let's talk through how we can help with this. So we are going to provide registration awareness and transparency. So starting next week for free, um, we will start to send notices through Pulse. They'll get pu push notices to encourage them to register for the clearinghouse so that drivers can go out and start to get registered for that. Um, we will record that a driver has been registered and where they are in the process, and we'll make it visible across the industry if a driver has signed up. So we're going to help you with the transparency, and we're going to help you with the awareness. Um, and we'll send you notices and notifications to both the drivers and the carriers when progress has been made. Okay, so now let's go through and talk about the queries that are required through the clearinghouse. Um, there's been some confusion about these, so I um, want to go through these, and of course, we'll have a session at the end for questions and encourage you guys to ask questions about these. Okay, so the limited query is um, a check of the clearinghouse just for the presence of information. It's just a limited, is there information in the clearinghouse about this driver? And we don't know exactly what it'll look like yet, but it'll be a yes or no, there is information or there's not information. Uh, employers will have to do this for all of their currently employed CDL holders annually. Um, we know you will be able to do it in batches. Um, and so uh, annual check, it can be either annually from when you hire the person until uh, you know their one year anniversary, or it can be um, also met if let's say you start on um, January 6th of, uh, you'll have to fulfill it at some point between January 6th, 2020 and January 6th of 2021. So um, if you meet that one year requirement, uh, either way, that will fulfill the requirement. And if there are multiple employer drivers, all employers will need to fulfill this annual limited query. So each um, employee that works for a particular operating authority with a DOT number will have to complete this for annually for their drivers. Um, you do need written consent from the driver um, that can be obtained outside of the clearinghouse via uh, an electronic or a wet signature, and it can be drafted to be valid for multiple years. The FMCSA has provided us a sample limited release or limited consent um, 
that they've put out. However, if you've looked at it, if you've seen it, um, it still sort of requires you to add in some fields um, that are based on how you're going to do um, the queries and when and how often you'll want to do it. Um, this signed um, limited query consent must be maintained in the employee's DQF file. So there are DQF uh, requirements here. Um, and um, importantly, if an employee doesn't sign a limited query consent, no limited query can be conducted and the employee must be removed from safety sensitive functions. So you, um, uh, you, you definitely want to make it, it within that year if you can't complete the one year um, requirement. So um, you want to make sure you get limited query consent. Um, and actually in your handouts, you should see um, 10 Street's sample limited query consent that we've uh, put out. It's uh, one that I have drafted, um, and I have uh, worked with um, other lawyers in the industry to um, get that drafted. Of course, I uh, have to do my typical legal disclaimer here, but, um, but it, it's drafted. It's out there. It should be in your handouts. Feel free to use that. Um, uh, and um, wanted to make sure that, that you guys had that. Okay, so um, last few things here. If the query, if you do a limited query and um, it shows no records, then you're done. And there's no more action required by the employer. But if you do the query and it shows that records are available in the clearinghouse on that particular driver, then the employer must conduct a full query within 24 hours um, after the limited query shows results. Otherwise, the employee has to be pulled from safety sensitive functions. Okay. And then let's go through the full um, query process. So what's a full query? This discloses detailed information about the drug and alcohol violations that will be, have been reported to the clearinghouse. We don't know yet what this will look like. We don't know if documentation will be provided. What we do know is that when you report violations, you have to um, have documentations in a lot of cases. So um, we're not sure if that information and that documentation will be provided, but what we do know is that there will be detailed information about those violations. Um, it, is, it is required pre-employment that you run a full query on all your prospective drivers. You have to have a pre, a full query done pre-employment. There was some confusion about that, and um, I've gone back, looked at the regulations, looked at the clearinghouse, and um, confirmed um, with a few other lawyers that it is required to do a full query before you can hire a CDL driver. Um, that, and that, of course, is starting on January 6, 2020. Um, the consent for a full query has to occur electronically within the clearinghouse. Um, if consent is refused, the employer will be notified and um, the driver will have to be removed from any safety sensitive functions. So um, that is if you have um, a driver that is currently employed, you run a limited query, the show information is present, and then you go in within 24 hours and they, uh, for a full query and they don't authorize it, then they will uh, have to be removed from safety sensitive functions. If the driver, if a new hire um, won't give you consent, then you, you will not be able to hire that individual. They are deemed to be disqualified um, if they won't authorize a full query. You cannot put them in safety sensitive functions. Um, one key thing to note is that if you pull a full query um, from the clearinghouse, then uh, it, and there's say there's no information. If new information is added, uh, removed, or corrected, then um, the employer will be notified within 30 days if uh, if that information is added. However, after 30 days, you you would have to go in and run another query. So if uh, I've had a lot of questions on that. Hey, what if we pay $1.25 and then there's information added two days later? You will get notification of um, that information that's added, but not, not after 30 days. Okay, I tried to jump in between those two for Shannon, sorry. <laughs> I was so excited to tell how we'll help. So um, one thing that we are gonna do is if you, if you, just, if you designate 10th Street as your TPA, we're gonna have a one-step ordering process integration to order and deliver those results back into 10th Street. Um, driver Pulse will, um, users will get received, or will receive via a push notice to let them know that they need to sign a limited consent query for you. That was modeled after the FMCSA sample 
Um, it's going to provide ongoing consent for multiple limit limited queries for the clearinghouse during the employment or contracted period without asking for an additional consent. Um, 10th Street will also assist with obtaining full queries, and we will use Pulse to notify drivers when they need to go out to the clearinghouse to come to give that consent back, and that information will come through the dashboard for you. So again, it's a one-step ordering process, an integrated process to make it easier on you and your drivers. And this will be available for your um, applicants and current employees. So one thing I just wanted to um, mention on the um, uh, limited query consent, um, it, it is modeled after the FMCSA sample. Um, however, um, once that is signed, that you will be able to, you won't have to go back to the driver during that employment period to get another limited query consent that will be good during the entire time uh, that they're employed with you. I also, or the contract period. I also um, added in there just information sort of for drivers if, the, if they're reading these consents. We all, we all hope that they're reading the consents, right? Maybe it's the delusional beliefs of a lawyer that knows that everybody, uh, thinks that everybody reads everything even though they probably don't. But if they're reading that consent, they will be informed um, that they um, won't be able to perform safety sensitive functions if they don't sign this. They'll also be informed that they will um, need to um, go into the clearinghouse and um, provide for a full query and consent to a full query if information does show up in, in the clearinghouse. So we tried to add all of that in so it's another form of awareness, another form of ed education as they're signing these limited query consents. Hopefully they'll be reading them and hopefully they will um, uh, have more education and, and information on that. Okay. Okay, so one of the things that um, uh, as we were um, talking with our partners and our clients, we realized that a lot of people were not aware of required policy and training updates that would need to occur based on this clearinghouse information. Um, so section 382.601B12, um, it was this was added back in 2016, I believe, where um, there's required training and required uh, drug and alcohol policies that you must have in place. Well, it, in 2016, it was added that you must notify your drivers. You must inform them and train them on um, the follow the information that's listed on this slide that will be reported. Um, to the clearinghouse. So all of those things, all of the information that will be in the clearinghouse, you're required to have training um, for this. And um, so uh, we want to make sure you all know about the training requirements. It's not something we talked about in the last webinar. Um, so you're, you're going to need to have some provisions for this, this type of training. So how we're going to be able to help you guys with this is we're going to have a free onboarding training document that will be delivered via Pulse or the portal um, for the document to, for the driver to sign, and it will be stored in the Documents tab for the driver so that you will have your training criteria done. We're also going to release an educational driver blog that's going to be accessible through Driver Pulse for the drivers to be able to learn all about the clearinghouse as well. And so I just want to note um, that... Uh, on these two things that on the, and on the training um, documents that are required, um, I have gone through those. I have drafted them. I have vetted them, and um, we will have essentially two different things available. We will have just a clearinghouse sort of addendum. We already have a policy that a driver has signed off on. Um, you can just add this clearinghouse piece. Um, um, which is just a one page, hey, this is, meets the training requirements of the regulations. But we also will have a full policy that matches the entire 12 requirements of um, those regulations um, available for you as well um, that includes, includes the updated clearinghouse information. Okay, so of course there are also um, DQF and record keeping requirements by the regulations. This um, will require you to retain records of each query and all information that is received in response to these queries for three years. Um, you will also have to retain the limited query consents for three years um, from the date of the last inquiry. So even if um, you know you run you run an annual inquiry and the driver leaves your employment, you will have to still hold on to that consent for three years after you've conducted the last query. 
Um, you must retain um, documents related to the administration of your entire drug and alcohol program for a minimum of five years. Um, and then the records for all drug and alcohol violations. Um, and the evidence regarding actual knowledge violations, any traffic citations used for actual knowledge citations, you have to retain all of those documents. Um, and then uh, a key thing is that um, records will be maintained in the clearinghouse um, and, and reported through the clearinghouse uh, until the return to duty process is complete and five years has passed since the violation. So both of those have to have to be matched. If, it, if there's a driver violation reported to the clearinghouse um, and there is no return to duty process complete, even if it's more than five years, let's say it's 10 years, but that particular driver never completed the return to duty process, it will still show up on a full query. It will still be in the clearinghouse. However, if the driver had a violation, did the return to duty process, and five years go by, past the violation, those records will no longer show up in the clearinghouse and in response to a full query. Um, so the two, two key things, you have record keeping requirements and then that's what the clearinghouse um, will report with regard to um, the violations. Okay, so a couple of different ways that we're gonna be able to help you with this. If you are using our DQF services, we're gonna be able to add that to the DQF so you can keep track of those. Also, if you're just for record keeping, those will be available in the documents tab and they're going to show. We're going to also help you with the limited release capture and then you can use the bulk ordering process to be able to order these annually. So if you have this setup where we could be your TPA and you want to order these annually, we'll have an easy process for you to be able to do that as well. Um, yeah, and so Azure TPA service will be able to perform full and limited queries for you and also gather those consents and keep those on file so that you'll have them for your annual process as well. Okay, and then uh, digging a little bit deeper into the regulations, one thing that we did not talk about on the last webinar is adverse action and what will be required. Um, if you will be taking adverse action um, based against an applicant based on information within the clearinghouse, then you will need to um, you will need to, to act to do some things. Adverse action, as we know, includes a multitude of things. It includes not hiring the individual based on the information, terminating, suspending, removing from duties. Any of those things qualify as adverse action, and you will need to make sure that you um, have an adverse action process. That is whether the adverse action requirements exist, whether the driver is disqualified based on information, or if you just are choosing not to hire or choosing to terminate um, a particular um, employee based on resolved violations that appear in the clearinghouse. So you will um, need to follow the adverse action process. We recommend the two-letter process. Um, the clearinghouse says that they are not a consumer reporting agency, so you might be saying, well, hey, why are you um, saying we have to follow this FCRA adverse action process if the clearinghouse is not a consumer reporting agency. And that's because the final rule um, specifically states, <laughs> even though they're not a consumer reporting agency and even though um, it's not a consumer report, the information that you get from the clearinghouse is not a consumer report, the final rule does indicate that it is what is referred to as an excluded communication such that um, you do need to follow the subsequent disclosure requirement under the FCRA. Well, the subsequent disclosure requirement, essentially, uh, you can follow the adverse action process and that will meet the subsequent disclosure requirement. And there's been some analysis with me and um, some other attorneys that I've been working with about what this subsequent disclosure requirement is and um, whether that's even correct or accurate and that that's really good advice to be following. And it's a little bit of a gray area. Um, so what we recommend, follow the adverse action process. Uh, the adverse action process will cover you, will cover any risk, um, and, um, and will be the best practice to make sure that you're fully complying with your obligations under the FCRA. Um, if you're going to do any other process other than the adverse action process, make sure um, that you get all of that cleared by an attorney, talk to counsel, um, I'm happy to have conversations and fill you in on why I think the adverse action process is the best practice. But you're definitely going to want to include clearinghouse within your adverse action process. 
and if you are a if you use 10 Street's adverse action process or service, it would meet this requirement. So you wouldn't have anything additional that you would need to do. We would be able to add it in and it would meet the requirement for the adverse action. Okay, so I am going to summarize just a little bit of how we're going to be able to help you with these processes. So Driver Pulse will be able to send push notices to the drivers and ask them if they could please register for the clearinghouse. Um, 10th Street will record that a driver has been registered and where they are in the process as you request the, as you make the request to the clearinghouse. We'll make it visible across the industry if the driver has registered. For limited and full query needs, we offer an integrated ordering and delivery for you to make it easier. Driver Pulse will receive push notices to let them know that they need to sign a query consent form if needed. The onboarding training documents will be delivered via Driver Pulse for signature. They can also be delivered through the portal. Educational blogs for the drivers that will be ass um, accessible, accessible, however that is, <laughs> for the driver through Pulse. There will also be automatic tracking and reporting with the DQF services. We will also meet the, um, meet the clearinghouse requirements on the adverse action. So we're going to take most of this information and we're going to make this process easier for everybody. Um, so I think with that, I think we'll go ahead and open it up to questions unless you have something to add, Shannon. No, um, I, I, the only thing I want to add um, to this uh, is we're really excited about this. We've got a lot of really great tools that are going to help you with these complex um, regulations that I, we know is not easy on our clients. We know it's not easy on the industry. Um, and so we want to be here to help. Um, I have, there's some handouts. Um, in those handouts, there's the 10th Street sample um, limited query consent that I've talked about already. There also is another document there which has a whole bunch of things from the Clearinghouse website um, that are great resources. There's one that, um, uh, in there which actually has the FMCSA sample limited query consent. And then there's a lot of um, just what will a driver need to do, what will an employer need to do, what will a, a third party administrator need to do, what can they do now, um, what occurs, what the process is. Um, there's a handout in there on um, the summarizing the queries and the consent process. And um, and then another great resource is if you go to the Clearinghouse website, there's a learning center, and you can poke around in there um, if you have any questions on how this is going to work. That learning center has been a um, really great, actually, uh, resource for me to send out. And um, I just want to really quick also plug our user con conference. Elizabeth is the organizer of, of that. She's doing a great job, and um, we're really excited for it. It is in April of 2020, and it is at the Bellagio this year. So if you haven't registered, it will be amazing. Um, we're really excited about it. We have a lot of feedback from our users that come. Um, it's pretty interactive, and we really work to make sure that your voices are heard and any enhancements or anything that you would like to see um, we want to hear those, and that's kind of a good place to have your voice heard. So definitely come and join us if you haven't registered already. We look forward to seeing everybody there. Absolutely. And, of course, we will have a session on the Clearinghouse. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move into the questions. We actually have a ton of questions. We do have a lot. Okay, just before we get started on the questions, though, a lot of people are asking if we're going to have a PDF of this webinar. So. Um, I'm going to create a PDF out of these slides and send it to everybody who has registered and has attended the, well, even registered and didn't attend the webinar. I'll send it out to everybody. And then you're also going to receive a recording of this webinar within the next 24 hours. So you will have it come to you in, in both ways. Oh, and also, Leah, we didn't mention, we are going to write a blog post mm -hmm. which talks about all of our um, products that we're going to do. It'll kind of add in a little bit of the compliance stuff as well, and then it'll have a link to the recording of this webinar. That's right. So in addition to the driver blog, it will have a carrier blog too that will give you more information about this and a more concise version of what we can do to help make, you know, do the heavy lifting here for you. Okay, so 
So return to duty reporting responsibility if you have a zero tolerance policy. We have somebody asking about that. That's correct. So um, you, it's my understanding, so you have a zero tolerance policy um, and you have a driver that has a violation and you, um, you terminate them. You will not have return to duty um, obligations unless you conduct that return to duty process for them. You will not have those obligations. The driver will have those obligations to make sure that they, um, uh, they, have a designated um, representative that will handle all of that reporting within them. But you, the employer will not have to do that if you have a zero tolerance policy and you terminate the um, driver after a violation that's reported to the clearinghouse. Okay. And so this one is asking, if they query the clearinghouse for any drug and alcohol violations, are they still required to obtain the information on the three year previous employer check for the same thing? Yes, for three years, you will still have that requirement. So until January 6th of 2023, you will still have the requirement um, to provide and to obtain the drug and alcohol violation on the employment, um, uh, a verification of employment under 391.23. Okay. And can you designate more than one TPA? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, simple, easy. Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have to make our MRO a TPA? No, that's a great question. I've gotten that one a lot. Um, your MRO will have its own obligations to register with the clearinghouse and its own obligations under the regulations to report, and they do not have to be a TPA um, at all under, um, under the clearinghouse rules. They will have to report it and report those violations um, all on their own, and it doesn't have to be connected to you at all. You will, however, might want to check with your MRO that they've reported the violation, because obviously they're going to report the violation to you. You'll want to make sure, hey, you've also um, reported it um, under your obligations. And once the information is reported, um, it will be in there. There's sort of some gray area of, well, the employer has the obligations and the MRO has the obligations. Is there going to be double reporting? I, um, I My hope is that the clearinghouse will have that um, figured out. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they've thought of that. Okay. And so when a driver does, uh, you know, for the limited query, will the, re will the consent form be added to their application into, go into when it goes to the dashboard? Yes. Before. Yeah. So um, we will add the, uh, sorry, my words got a little fumbled there. We'll add the disclosure to the application. We'll also have a process for you to be able to reach out to your current pool of drivers through the dashboard so that you can have them just sign the clearinghouse release so that you have that on file when you need to go back and do your annual process to do those orders. So we're going to help you with that as well um, for those disclosures. Okay. Um, here's just an example question. If you if the driver's hire date is 1-6-2020, will a full query need to be ran that day? Yes. <laughs> I'm uh, sure that wasn't seems, what they wanted to hear. Well, I know, and it seems, I, I, I'm again, burdensome process mm -hmm. for uh, for our carriers that we want to help with. Um, but yes, starting January 6th of 2020, let's say you sign on at 9 a.m., <laughs> you're the first user, it might be 8 a.m., who knows, they might be early risers, and um, and hey, we need to, we want to hire this guy, we want to run a query, very unlikely that there will be information in there, but the regulations say you've got to run that full query. And how long does the driver have to give consent for that? <clears throat> That's a great question. It, as long as they want uh, to take. It's because it's a pre-hire process. Um, you All that it means is that um, you cannot put them in a safety-sensitive function until you get that result back. So um, if it's a pre-employment full query, um, they have they, they might never go in and consent to it, um, and um, they have as long as they want. So that's why we're going to have some resources to help you with that. Um, but they don't necessarily have to go in. They, If they're registered, they will get notified. Um, right now, as we understand it, via email. Um, and of course, if you um, use our products and, and have Pulse and all of that, you'll be able to um, help notify the driver as well with those things. Yep. Well, we will, um, if you're... If we're able to help with the ordering process, we will notify the drivers when they need to go out. Um, and we will probably keep notifying them until the results return, um, just to kind of encourage them to go out and release those and get them over to you. Yep. OK, some registration questions for if you're a DOT driver staffing agency, how would you register? Would you register? Do you know? 
Um, well, that's a very interesting question. I think um, it, uh, it, it, since you wouldn't be an employer, um, the, that you would um, not – so if you were going, you would need to be then – I haven't seen any guidance on this, um, but my, my thought process is that you would be a TPA designated by um, the, the employer if you're going to be running the full query. Otherwise, it's just the employer's requirement that they run the full query, but um, if you're the um, – <clears throat> If you're going to be going in um, for, you know, let's say, to see what the, what the check is, um, you would either register as the employer or you would register as the em employer's TPA. I'm, I, that's not real clear. There's a lot of things that um, occur in the industry that these regulations don't take into effect, and um, that is one of those scenarios. Okay, and what about owner-operators that are, so owner-operators that are leased onto a company, are they responsible for registering with a clearinghouse? Yes. Okay. The regulations place a lot of burdens on those owner operators, and that is one of them. They have mandatory registration, just like the employers. Okay. So adverse action. So for adverse action, for adverse action, do they need to or do we supply a copy of the query? Yes, you will need to send out um, with the adverse action letter a copy of the query that's done. So um, if you aren't um, real familiar with the adverse action process, I would highly encourage you to go to the compliance section of our website and listen to the adverse action webinar that I did. It's a two-letter process um, with the pre-adverse action letter including uh, the clearinghouse information um, on how the driver would contact the clearinghouse for, it would in include all consumer reporting agencies, but also would include the clearinghouse information, and because the driver would be able to go in and dispute the information with the clearinghouse, and so you want to include the contact information, and then um, you would need to also include the query that was run, along with all of your other consumer reports that you've run. Okay. Um. Okay, and we can obviously help with that with our adverse action services. So if you don't have that and you want to look into it, definitely do give your advisor or your account manager a call. Um, yep. Driver polls, if they don't use driver polls, if the candidate doesn't participate or they don't want to download it or, you know, they have a bunch of drivers who don't use it, you know, like I said, what would you, what happens then? How are those, how does that work? As far as all the services that we're providing through driver polls, how does it work if they don't have it? Um, so. As far as like the training documents and things along those lines, um, they'll still be able to complete those through the portal, so they don't actually have to have driver polls to complete that. Um, they'll get notices via email if they are registered for the clearinghouse, and if they are not, we should be able to email them as well to just say, hey, we've got a request out there for you. So there's a couple of workarounds with email that we'll be able to um, to push to the driver, but polls will be the first. Um, the first option, and then we'll move from there. Yeah, and um, uh, and the same with like we're going to be doing a driver facing blog post, and so if you hey want to get the word out about this, um, you can um, you know send out that link to the driver facing blog post and, and other things. Okay, and do we need con to consent? Do we need the consent form from all of their owner operators before one six of twenty? Um, if, no, you would just need, well, um, no, you would just need, for your owner operators, you would need to run a limited query at some point to comply with the annual process, uh, the annual limited query process that you'll have to run. So you don't necessarily have to have them signed before January 6th of 2020, um, but you will need to have it signed and run on those owner operators before um, January 6th of 2021 within that one year. Okay. There were a couple questions about that. We have a ton of questions here. And um, just while Leah is looking through those questions to see <laughs> which ones are next, um, I'll just say that we will get to your questions. If we don't answer it on this webinar, we will get to them. We do respond um, to all the questions um, afterwards if we don't get to answering it on the webinar. Um, I had a question about what is the difference between a full query and a limited query. And um, again, the full query, um, you have to have the driver consent within the clearinghouse, and it will um, 
uh, provide all the information about violations um, from the clearinghouse. A limited query will just uh, have to have written consent outside of the clearinghouse um, that can remain on file um, for multiple years over multiple que limited queries um, during the employment of um, the individual and um, it will, when you query it, it will only show whether there is the presence of information available or not. Okay, can we, do we have any idea how long the results will take to come back? We do not know that yet. That is all um, within the clearinghouse and what their processes are going to be. It's going to be very interesting because as we know, there's going to be anywhere between four to six million users. There's going to be a lot of activity come January 6th, uh, 2020, and um, hopefully the clearinghouse will be ready. We will be. <laughs> so can you see that you had sent them? Once they, if you do send them and they come back, will you be able to see that in the communications area in within 10th Street? Do we? For a request? For, yes. Oh, yeah. For a request, so you would use your process and you would be able to go in and request um, request that and it would show in the documents tab when it returns. So just like any other thing that you receive back, you would get a reminder and you would be able to see that in the documents tab and see that you had requested in the, in the schedule communicate, or not in the schedule communication, sorry, in the, in the, uh, under the process menu, the process log, sorry, <laughs> I went blank, <laughs> sorry about that. We've had a couple of questions on the cost for each query, and so um, well, there is a plan sheet that has been put out by the clearinghouse. It's a dollar twenty-five um, per query, whether that query is a limited query or a full query. That is the cost for the clearinghouse. And um, the clearinghouse has also made it clear there was actually some new information released about this. Um, the, the employer or the, um, the carrier will have to purchase the query plans. And then you can designate a TPA to use those query plans. So a TPA will not be able to purchase those query plans for you. Um, so for 10th Street, for example, you would have to purchase the query plans and then um, allow 10th Street to be able to be your TPA that does, does those queries um, under, under that cost. Um, so that is one of the sort of confusing things under the clearinghouse. But, but the TPA will not be able to purchase the query plan for you. Yep. And there and just from a 10th Street side as well, like if you designate us as your TPA and you request us to make these um, requests on behalf of you, there will be a fee from the 10th Street side as well, but it will be minimal. But just um, for total transparency, there will be a fee for that as well. For yeah. performing a service. Yes. And then a lot of these actually if you're if you're already an enterprise client, you're going to get a lot of these benefits for free already. So a lot of it won't cost you if you and again if you already are paying for DQF or adverse action, again this is just going to kind of already work with those with those services. So um, yeah, the queries are one thing that will have that will have an uh, an incur an additional kind of fee, but then we don't have a you know full pricing plan laid out right now, but just know that a lot of these benefits will be just delivered. Yeah. you know, without cost. A lot of the things that we help you with are free, um, but there are some additional things that may cost. Okay, so that hopefully answered a few of these. I'm still working through them. We really appreciate everybody that's been on the webinar today. It's uh, um, been uh, been great. And of course, as you have questions, um, please feel free to contact your 10th Street account manager, um, your 10th Street advisors, um, and um, you know we're happy to uh, get on the phone and, and talk you through this. Um, also, stay tuned. We will have a blog post coming out. So, um, I. I know there's a lot of questions on here. I, a lot of them are kind of, you know, rewording other questions that I, we, I believe we've answered. But if you haven't had yours answered, I apologize. We're about to reach the hour limit. I do want to go back. We'll, we'll go back through these and make sure that we got everybody answered. If you have additional questions, please write in and we'll get those answered as well. Um, we'll have more information in the blog too, and you'll have additional. You'll have access to this recording as well as to a PDF of the slides. Um, and again, like Shannon said, I, I want to really thank everybody for coming today. Um, I know this is a confusing thing and it's, you know, no one really knows what to expect and you guys are really busy as it is, so I appreciate you joining us today and we will uh, have more information for you. We'll reach out to you soon and yeah, okay. th thank you so thank much. You Thanks again. Bye-bye.